Previously on Transformers University, we have explored the Transformers brand for 49 episodes, and now we are celebrating the 50th episode of this podcast with a multi-part look into the centerpiece of Transformers fiction with our look at Transformers, the movie right now on Transformers University. Hello, my friend, and welcome to Transformers University. I am your host, Anthony Brucali, owner, operator, madman behind TFU.info, the Toy Archive, the podcast, the social media, and more. And today, we are hitting one of the high points of Transformers fiction, uh, arguably the most well-known piece of Transformers fiction, and that is the 1986 Transformers animated movie called Transformers the movie and uh, there is a lot to cover with this film there is a lot of important stuff so we are actually splitting this into uh, a multiple part episode so uh, I don't want to give away everything that's coming up but uh, we've got a lot of guests Uh, we've got some great stuff lined up it's a classic you know it you love it Um, and uh, I will even share a little bit of my history with this film Uh, I didn't see it when it came out uh, a lot of people have uh, had the same experience. I actually read the adapted comic first and rented it some point uh, way after it came out. Uh, as many of you might know, I was more of a GoBots kid growing up uh, and then kind of shifted to Transformers as I fell in love with the comic. Um, that said, I kind of had some of the, the big plot points spoiled and... Uh, we are going to spoil the hell out of this movie, and I'm sorry, you've had over 30 years to watch it. Um, so both, here's your last chance to punch out before uh, myself and our all-star lineup of guests. And I'm not kidding, we have uh, more guests in these next uh, two episodes uh, than we've ever had on any uh, two episodes prior uh, in this podcast. Uh, so a lot of people you're familiar with, a lot of new faces as well. So, uh, let's talk about this film. So, this film starts out with uh, the slate for the production company, and that is DEG, De Laurentiis Entertainment Group. Uh, That is the uh, company run by Dino De Laurentiis, a famed Hollywood producer, uh, the producer behind films such as the first few uh, Halloween movies, uh, the movie Serpico with... Al Pacino, uh, Army of Darkness, and uh, also Dino De Laurentiis, known for being the grandfather of uh, Food Network star Giada De Laurentiis. And uh, (laughs) uh, that is an odd tie to the Transformers brand, but there is one right there. Now, this movie opens with uh, Unicron, uh, who we are meeting for the first time. He is a giant planet-sized thing. Uh, and he is a hungry, hungry planet. He will eat uh, the planet Lithone. And we are introduced to uh, two Lithonians, uh, Arbalus and Kranix. Uh, and uh, they attempt to escape. And for a bit more about Lithone and uh, the interesting features there, I'm going to toss it over to our first new guest on the show. Uh, and that is Paul from Robots with Coffee. I'm Paul, the creator of Robots with Coffee, and I've been a fan of Transformers since the second episode of the original cartoon came out in 1984. Um, As far as Transformers the movie, I didn't see it until 1996, 10 years after it came out. Uh, Someone had sort of spoiled the battle between Optimus Prime and Megatron for me on, on on the schoolyard, and I... Just never got around to seeing it. I think my parents didn't want me seeing a giant movie commercial, but um, yeah, I loved the cartoon. I loved I loved the whole thing. Anyway, uh, in 1996, when I finally saw it in, in my uh, RA's dorm room on video, I was quite taken aback. Like, who are these people? How come they? You know, how come none of the original cast or anyone from the cartoon cast got a promotion? You know, and and now Megatron learns to shoot. Um, 
I know it's important to a lot of other people. It's just a really weird movie to me. But I was reading an interview with one of the uh, artists behind it, and something stuck with me about creating uh, a lot of the background characters for some of those opening scenes and how they just had to create a lot of different characters. And what they did was they had six of each part, six arms, six legs, six knees, six heads, you know, six different kinds of everything. And they would mix and match them after creating those individual parts for each body part. Uh, that way they could create a bunch of different characters on the fly. And I'm not sure which who, who said that, but that, that was actually something that's like, wow, that's, that's pretty good character creation right there. I know when I get stuck and I'm just doodling on my uh, dopey robots, um, and that actually comes in handy. I just kind of think up of a, of a part I've already used for a character with, with a different look and, uh, you know, I'm able to finish drawing something for, you know, one-off or whatever. Um, so there you go. That's that's what Transformers the cartoon movie meant for me. And you can catch Paul and the gang from Robots with Coffee on their website, www.robotswithcoffee.com or on Twitter at RobotsWCoffee. And this scene of... Unicron eating Lathone takes us right into the credits. And uh, the credits kick off with the Transformers theme as performed by the band Lion. Now, don't confuse them with White Lion. This is a completely separate band. Now, as the uh, credits roll by and uh, we get past the voice actors, we find out that this uh, film was written by Ron Friedman. Now, Friedman is a, was a long time. Hollywood uh, writer, wrote on sitcoms in the 60s and 70s, such as Gilligan's Island and Get Smart, uh, The Odd Couple, and The Andy Griffith Show. Uh, but he is also part of the uh, inextricable tie between G.I. Joe and the Transformers. Uh, those of you who, who remember the history of uh, the toy line, uh, uh, the Transformers line comes out of Microman, which uh, in turn came out of uh, Hasbro importing uh, G.I. Joe into Japan, but they needed to make it not an American soldier. And so uh, Microman was born off the original uh, G.I. Joe figures. So with that, we answer, eventually get to Micro Change, which gets the first year of, uh, or part of the first year of the Transformers toys. And this is actually a theme we'll be covering a lot in 1986. There is a lot of ties between G.I. Joe and Transformers, something that will continue on uh, to the present. And uh, it just gets stronger uh, with Transformers the movie because Ron Freeman didn't only write um, Transformers the movie. He wrote uh, G.I. Joe the movie. And he also wrote all of the five-parters in the G.I. Joe cartoon. So that is the uh, two initial pilot films as well as Arise, Serpentor, Arise. And the Pyramid of Darkness. But that isn't the only uh, cartoon output for Ron Friedman. He was also the creator of another sometimes forgotten 80s cartoon. We are a family. I fight for them. They fight for me. As close as we can be. I am the mountain or deep in the sea. My army, my army. Now, while Ron Friedman was credited as the writer, he only wrote the original draft according to story consultant Flint Dilly. Now, Flint Dilly uh, was pretty much the writer of this film. Uh, but, however, Friedman had it in his contract after writing the draft that he uh, was to be credited as the writer no matter what happened to the story. Now, this credit sequence also is worth noting because it is a little bit different uh, depending on what part of the world you saw the film in. Now, after the credits, we get into part of the movie. But in Europe, they had a very Star Wars-esque uh, scroll of text, and it read as follows. There's an evil new force in the universe, a monster planet that devours everything in its path. 
and it's heading for the small planet of Cybertron, where a unique race of transforming robots continue to fight a civil war, a war between good and evil that has raged for millions of years. The evil Decepticon Transformers, led by the maniacal Megatron, have sworn to crush their enemies, the Autobots. To this end, they have relentlessly pursued them across the galaxy from planet Cybertron to planet Earth and back again. But the heroic Autobot Transformers and their courageous leader, Optimus Prime, are not easily defeated. And that is a lot of exposition. Uh, but after that, and in North America, we got our exposition with one very simple phrase. It is the year 2005. So in the far-flung future, 13 years ago in the year 2005, <laughs> or 20 years ahead of when they were actually making the film, uh, we find out that, one, the Autobots are uh, headquartered on Cybertron's moon, and we find out that Cybertron has two moons. Uh, we also find uh, that Jazz is on one of those moons, and this is actually the final speaking role for uh, Scatman Crothers, uh, the actor who played Jazz. We also find out that Spike has a son named Daniel, and there is an Autobot city on Earth. Uh, we also find out that the Autobots still have lousy security because Laserbeak is spying on them the entire time. Prime is sending a, a, a ship to Autobot City to help them out, and uh, Ironhide will be uh, leading that ship, and they're going to need a little help getting to Earth. Now, all we need is a little energon and a lot of luck. So, Laserbeak uh, reports back to Megatron and transforms to his cassette mode and actually plays back video. And I find this interesting because the video has scan lines, which means the video was analog. You would figure a robot like Laserbeak would shoot in some sort of digital format. Now, Megatron, the uh, Seekers, the Constructicons, Insecticons, Soundwave, uh, they make a move to attack this shuttle en route to Earth. And I think this is one of the good times to point out some of the differences in the film between the final version of this film and the storyboards. So there is a website, a blog, called TFRAW, and you can get that at tfraw.blogspot.com. And they have assembled uh, an amazing PDF or CBR, or if you just want to go uh, scene by scene, they also have it um, linked on their website. And... It has the entire storyboard of the film in order, uh, and there's a lot of stuff that were was cut out. And I'm going to uh, talk a bit about them when I can, when I've noticed some things. That said, um, it's not going to be an exhaustive list of the differences. Now, the first thing that's worth noting, because this is a big scene, right? Um, the Autobot shuttle heading to Earth in the storyboard. Um, and as seen in the film, Prowl and Ironhide are the ones uh, at the front of the ship piloting it. And in the storyboard, there's a flash of light across the screen. Uh, and it's a comet and uh, an ice storm behind the comet. And the Autobots are dodging that comet and those uh, ice chunks uh, until there's an explosion at the back of the ship. Uh, and Ironhide says, uh, that wasn't no ice chunk. And actually, Prowl had a line uh, just prior to that, which is why Michael Bell is credited in the uh, credits for the film as Prowl. This leads us to the first of many critical scenes uh, that have lived on throughout the ages. Uh, tee up the music, instruments of destruction, and for more on his memories of this song in the film, here is David from Stasis Pod Podcast. When I think of Transformers the movie, one of the first scenes that usually pops into my head, instruments of destruction, tools of foul play, a vile interruption, existence drifts away. The attack on the Autobot shuttle with the my fa favorite song in the movie, Instruments of Destruction by Energy. I mean, Dare is a better song, but Instruments of Destruction is just... It's what I think of as the Decepticons and how they operate, especially in the movie. Just coming aboard from shooting Brawn in the shoulder to 
such heroic nonsense killing Ironhide. It, it's, uh, it, it's a culmination of everything I like about the movie. Wall-to-wall heavy metal music. Violence that we had not seen in the original cartoon. Uh, Starscream being peak Starscream. He's at his best and, and snarkiest. And Megatron tells him, you're an idiot, Starscream, which is wonderful. Uh, also, we see foreshadowing. When a Transformer dies, they turn gray. Prowl turns gray as smoke comes out of his mouth. Uh, note that Brawn, who gets shot in the shoulder, doesn't turn gray. He's not dead. He survives. <laughs> But yeah, it's oh, it's it's a great song. It's great action. The animation. It's it just oh, it's it's so much fun. It's what the movie is about: music and robot violence. <laughs> and you can catch David and the gang from Stasis Pod and their other podcast, Icon Underground, at www.iconunderground.net. And for a bit more about. Just how this scene made him feel. Another new guest on the show. I'm going to toss it to Ben Yi of Ben's World of Transformers, BWTF.com, for more. The one moment in the 1986 movie that has stuck with me to this day as an adult, many, many moons later. <laughs> uh, wow. I, You know, it, it's kind of a cop-out answer, but like, I swear to you, the whole movie is just burned in my brain as a collective whole. Uh, I, you know what I will say, um, rewatching it as I do at least once a year, uh, the moment that really grabs you, I think as an old school fan is when the Decepticons first blast onto the Autobot shuttle and they take down Braun with one shot. And then you see Prowl go down. Like it, it happens within like five seconds. And I think, that was the moment, even as a kid, all the way to now, where you your brain resets from the expectations you had of the cartoon from seasons one and two, uh, all the and all of a sudden you realize you're dealing with a whole new game where uh, characters can die, there and mortality is not a very dramatic, maybe one-off episode thing, um, but instead is the norm for this story, and it really reset the board in terms of how the Transformers story would go from that direction forward. And Ben is right. That scene is a game changer. Uh, so, you know, the Decepticons enter that ship and Braun is uh, shot uh, in the shoulder uh, and he did not turn gray. So I don't know if he died. Uh, that is a long running uh, Transformer fan thing that Braun was not killed in that attack. But uh, it is worth mentioning that in the storyboard for that scene, he is shot through the chest and his chest explodes, which is not exactly what happened on screen. But uh, neat little Easter egg, uh, if you saw the uh, recent Bumblebee film by Travis Knight, uh, the quick scene at the beginning of the film where you do see Braun, uh, he does get shot in the shoulder. Now, and then... Prowl and Ratchet get taken down, as does Ironhide. And Ironhide's death is uh, particularly vicious. And it's punctuated with one of the classic lines of all time. This was almost too easy, Starscream. Much easier, almighty Megatron, than attacking the real threat, the Autobots moon base. You're an idiot, Starscream. When we slip by their early warning systems in their own shuttle and destroy Autobot City, the Autobots will be vanquished forever! No! Such heroic nonsense. As Ben put it, you know, uh, cartoon characters can die. Um, prior to this, we didn't see many examples of that. Um, it, so much so that it's a key plot point in uh, the film Who Framed Roger Rabbit that cartoons don't die and uh, the handful of tunes that have died on screen uh, that I could think of off the top of my head I had three uh, Bambi's mom Charlotte from Charlotte's Web and General Woundwort from Watership Down which may be the only film I can think of that is animated and as violent as Transformers the movie that actually precedes it um, 
And the other neat thing about uh, Ironhide's execution here in this um, scene is how well the music ties into it. So as he's uh, shot, uh, it's timed out to uh, the cold ending of the, fi of the music and uh, the scream from the song uh, that, that caps off the song. And so one more time, let's give a listen, but pay particular attention uh, to the soundtrack. No! Such heroic nonsense! So now we cut to Earth, and Hot Rod and Daniel are fishing. And uh, something I haven't noticed until this viewing is that uh, while Hot Rod and Daniel are catching fish, there's a subtle joke about the fish's size. Whoa, look at the size of it! Yep, it's a whopper, all right. So if you think about it, it's Hot Rod delivering that line about the fish being a whopper, and comparatively to Hot Rod's size, um, all the fish are going to be small. <laughs> and uh, it's also neat to know here that uh, Hot Rod then takes the fish and throws it back before they head out. Um, he doesn't kill it, which is uh, in stark contrast to what we just saw with the Decepticons. You know on TV, when they have a fishing show on TV, they catch the fish, but they let it go. They don't want to eat the fish, but they do want to make it late for something. <laughs> Where were you? I got caught. <laughs> Liar, let me see the inside of your lip. So uh, Daniel and Hot Rod head out. Daniel has a hoverboard in the year 2005. More lies from Hollywood about what the future was going to be like. <laughs> and for more on this scene, I'm going to uh, toss it to my friend Jen from the Stasis Pod and Icon Underground podcasts. Hi, this is Jen from Stasis Pod and Icon Underground Radio. Man, the the cheap answer would be to say that all of Transformers the movie has followed me well into adulthood. Uh, we did just recently do a Patreon special in which, without a refresher viewing, we managed to talk to uh, talk about it for about uh, three full hours, uh, twice the runtime of the movie. Uh, but to really narrow it down, when I think Transformers the movie, the first scene that pops into my head. Uh, is uh, the whole introduction of Hot Rod and Dare, uh, that whole scene uh, where, I mean, I really like Hot Rod as a character. Uh, I joke about being straight for Hot Rod, but I think it's more like I want to be that cool. Uh, and he, you know, we see him hanging out with Daniel, and then once he goes to greet the shuttle, the way that the music kicks in there is very much, it's that, I mean, it's not actually a training montage, but it, it keys into the same energy of tying the music to the action uh, that you get in things like training montages. And that sort of combination of action and that driving rock kind of music just does something to me. Uh, and then you know, the, the really, it's, it's beautiful animation of, you know, Daniel coming and, and hitting the rock on his hoverboard and Hot Rod just picking him up. If you're gonna ride, Dano, ride in style. And they just drive off and you get this beautiful view of Autobot City and you've got Cup being cranky. Turbo rubbing, young punk. I'll straighten you out yet. And, and they get up there on top of the mountain and it's just, it's all just beautifully animated. Uh, it's introduction of a character who has really stayed with me, a song that is absolutely, I think, one of the best, like, cheesy, uplifting rock songs of the 80s. Uh, and it just establishes a lot of the action for really the first act of the movie. And when I, you know, when Transformers the movie pops in my head, that's what I think of. So, fun fact about the barricade that Cup and company are building, the Autobots who are there with him are Huffer, Blue Streak, Hound, and Sunstreaker. Um, 
and that'll be interesting to note later on, and we'll, we'll explain that in a little bit. But the only one actually pointed out in the storyboards, as far as I could see, was Hound. Now, the uh, Hot Rod and Daniel, they get to Lookout Mountain. Daniel notices a hole in the shuttle, um, and Hot Rod then fires on the shuttle, and the Battle of Autobot City begins. Hot Rod fired the first shot, and so uh, the young kid characters in this film, the young Autobot and Hot Rod, the young kid and Daniel, they're the ones initiating the change. And so for a little more on that scene, here is Daryl, a.k.a. the Cybertronian Beast from Transmissions Podcast. This is Daryl, a.k.a. the Cybertronian Beast. My favorite part, and to this day, it's the exact same bit, and I still... Like I still get goosebumps when the part comes on. Uh, is is when uh, uh, Hot Rod starts firing at the ship coming in and blows a hole in it, and Megatron and the Septicons come out, and then that battle starts. I still I still get goosebumps thinking about that moment. It's it's a great moment. The music comes in right at the perfect time. The animation is great. Uh, oh, it's just it's a perfect moment. Um, the movie itself, it it like starts at the climax, uh, and then kind of dies, and then comes back up again. It's a it's a bit of a U shape if you look at the how it how the climax is written. Just the beginning of that movie is just a killer for anyone who's into the the first two seasons of that show. As Daniel and Hot Rod are on top of Lookout Mountain, they get fired on by the Decepticons, destroying the Lookout Post, and uh, they fall down. And this is actually. Um, a point in the film uh, where the storyboard really does diverge uh, a bit from what happened in the film. So the storyboard calls for uh, the two Constructicons, Hook and Scavenger, to actually attack uh, Hot Rod while he's holding Daniel. And uh, Hot Rod defends himself. He, uh, He kicks Scavenger in the face, which then sends Scavenger into Hook and then down the mountain and then rocks on top of them uh, before uh, Hot Rod looks down and sees Blitzwing coming at him and uh, uh, gets told to come on down, Auto Brat. Come on down, Auto Brat! So there's that big gap in there that was removed from the storyboard. But uh, So in the film, that scene... Uh, just goes from Hot Rod and Daniel falling off the mountain to um, Blitzwing taking aim at them. Uh, and Cup jumps in to save Hot Rod from Blitzwing and uh, aims his gun uh, at Shrapnel, causing Blitzwing to shoot Shrapnel. And this is uh, a thing about this film. This film is intense. There is a breakneck pace to this film, uh, part because of there's so much action. We are barely 12 minutes into this film we're not even at 12 minutes uh into this film and uh there's already been uh four character deaths um two fight scenes that planet's been blown up and the other important thing to note here is uh how well the soundtrack ties into this film and so the musical soundtrack is a really really important thing to this film uh and by this point we're well into the song dare and so we're 12 minutes into this film, we're just shy of that, 11.47 to be exact, when, when the song starts. And we're already three songs deep into the film. And that's very much a, a storytelling uh, tactic of the 80s. A lot of 80s films use uh, the song to carry the movie. I always reference Rocky IV as the example for that. But that means the Battle of Autobot City begins. And once Dare ends is really where the... the the city battle starts uh, visually. And uh, we flip from soundtrack to uh, the Vince DiCola score. And for more on that score, we're going to toss to Daryl's co-host on Transmissions Podcast, uh, Jeremy, with more. I think for me, it's not like one moment. It's just the music in the, the movie the soundtrack was one of the first things I went for when Napster became a thing. And I've probably over the course of the few of the years, I've bought, you know, the soundtrack 
a number of different ways. I, I think I have it on cassette, CD, digital, and I, I have the Vince DiCola score. Listening to the music, you can picture the scenes that are happening in the movie. It was just something that, like, through my college years and, you know, even now when I want to concentrate, I'll listen to stuff from the, the, the movie. Like, when I, when I want to concentrate, the Vince DiCola soundtrack is one of the things that I have in my playlist that I go to where I need to listen to something, but I can't listen to words. If I, I'm just out and I'm tired of listening to podcasts and I need to listen to something, more often than not, I'll go to the 86 movie soundtrack just to have some music to listen to. I mean, it's it's not one moment, but it, it's a constant throughout the movie. I mean, the, the music is just nonstop. And the Bumblebee movie could learn a bit in how to more effectively use 80s music in, in a movie if Travis Knight had spent some more time watching the 86 movie. The music, just if it's a moment in time, it, it fits the the tone of the movie and... It always puts a smile on my face. So uh, that's what I would say um, has really stuck with me in the the you know thirty plus years since the movie. Again, I'm, I'm Jeremy from the Transmissions Podcast, and uh, you can find all of our stuff at transmissionspodcast.com. So inside of Autobot City, Perceptor is observing the situation, and we meet. Uh, a bunch of new Autobots for the first time in the U.S. show. We meet Ultra Magnus, who is in his toy colors, uh, but was originally colored uh, as per a promo uh, for the film. He was one of the last Diaclone toys to be imported uh, as part of the main Generation 1 line. And uh, the early promo version, you can find this on YouTube, uh, of the trailer has him in his diaclone colors, which are more instead of being uh, blue with red and white or uh, black with red and blue. Uh, we also meet Springer, RC, and Blur, and we find out the Autobots are at a disadvantage. Um, <laughs> how are they at a disadvantage? Um, they, you know, they have uh, the numbers on the Decepticons for the most part, um, at least historically. And even in this situation, they should have the numbers on the Decepticons, and they have the fortress uh, that they're in. Um, this is never really properly explained, but uh, we'll roll with it that they're at a tactical disadvantage. Uh, because, I guess, because the Decepticons had the element of surprise. Uh, Springer and RC need to uh, manually transform Autobot City, and the Insecticons begin to chow down on the door to the city. And uh, in doing so... Uh, leave uh, Cup and Hot Rod to be a bit creative. The Insecticons are in our way! Wrong! They're our way in! And one of the interesting things leading up to this is that the um, the hallway, the bridge area that, uh, the drawbridge if you will, uh, that the Autobots, uh, Cup and Hot Rod enter through, uh, in the storyboard just before they uh, use the Insecticons as their way in um, there's actually a scene, a quick scene here, of uh, Mirage inside of Autobot City. We don't see Mirage in this film. Um, shooting Bombshell as he retracts the uh, bridge entrance, uh, which the Insecticons would later try to eat. So, the Battle of Autobot City rages on into the night. Blaster and Perceptor send an SOS to Optimus Prime and Soundwave sends out his cassettes to jam the transmission. Uh, the, cats, the cassettes in question rumble frenzy, both the red one because of an animation coloring error for uh, at least one shot, uh, but eventually it'll be rumble the blue one and frenzy the red one along with Ravage and Ratbat. Blaster defends uh, the communication tower with cassettes of his own, Ramhorn, Steeljaw, Eject, and Rewind. And so the battle rages on into the night, and again, once again, we're informed by the storyboards that uh, there are a number of changes here uh, to the film. So as the battle rages on, uh, Ultra Magnus begins to command the Autobots inside of the city to uh, take their battle stations. And uh, in the scene shown, uh, we see uh, Sideswipe 
though he's marked Sunstreaker, he's definitely drawn a sideswipe and uh, Wheeljack running along the ramparts uh, to help defend the city. And in this scene, Hot Rod is scolded by Ultra Magnus for uh, violating security protocols by breaking into Autobot City. From here, uh, we pick up where the uh, movie actually does continue on. That is Springer and RC ready a giant uh, crossbow tank of sorts. They push it into position. But uh, before they do, RC is um, gathering up some of the fallen Autobots. And in this scene, it is the corpses of Windcharger and Wheeljack. And uh, in the storyboards, uh, it wasn't supposed to be Wheeljack. It actually only refers to them as uh, two uh, two Autobots dead on the ground. And Windcharger is one of them because the, the storyboard definitely does refer to Windcharger. However, it is uh, Smokescreen drawn next to him uh, dead on the ground in the storyboard. And actually, if you look at the shot before in the film, uh, the body that is Wheeljack's is colored uh, in smoke screens, uh, red, white, and blue uh, color scheme. So Cup, Daniel, uh, and Hot Rod arrive to help out, and uh, RC not too happy with the young Autobot. I was afraid you'd be trapped outside the city. Uh, hey, I wasn't worried for a microsecond. Then you probably didn't understand the situation. And so the Decepticons unleash Devastator, and Springer drops his most famous line. I got better things to do tonight than die. So Springer fires bombs into Devastator and the Decepticons as the Autobots continue to defend, and the battle continues into the overnight. And um, in that shot of uh, the Autobots fighting outside at night, we see Perceptor and Grapple firing on uh, off screen, you know, into the off screen area. And we also see Swoop, who is technically not on the planet yet, also running by. In the storyboard, uh, Perceptor is the only one who is actually still left over from the uh, grapple was supposed to be Blur, and uh, the running legs through the shot were supposed to be Cup. And so the battle now continues on into the early, into the morning. And uh, in the storyboard, Another neat little tidbit here is that uh, the Autobots that are in the wreckage uh, continuing to fight back. Uh, among the ones drawn in there are Blaster and Wheeljack. And at this point, Optimus Prime's shuttle arrives and somehow Sunstreaker is piloting it uh, even though he has been shown on the ground. So uh, the storyboard does call for Sunstreaker in that spot, so I'm guessing when he was building the barricade with Cup, he was actually an animation error. Uh, Prime sends the Dinobots, uh, Grimlock, Slag, Sludge, and Swoop, no snarl in this scene, uh, to fight a Devastator. Uh, Devastator kicks Grimlock, uh, pounds Sludge, who's in Dinobot mode, and uh, in this scene there's one of the more uh, humorous moments of the film is that when he pounds him, his eyes go cartoony and uh, pop off of his head before popping back on. Uh, before Slag then uh, slams into Devastator and takes him down. And back to the storyboards for a few cameos here. Uh, when Devastator falls through the door uh, or the wall of Autobot City, uh, Blue Streak and Wheeljack are on the other side watching the explosion uh, before fleeing. And so is here where Optimus Prime lands, and it is on. Megatron must be stopped, no matter the cost. And this is where Prime just kicks the crap out of everyone. So he transforms into his vehicle mode. He runs over Thrust in this awesome shot where Thrust is reflected in the grill of the front of Optimus Prime. He then runs over uh, Shrapnel, uh, we get an interior shot of Optimus's cab, which has the Autobot symbol on his horn, uh, as he tries to take down Blitzwing, but Blitzwing flies away, and he's the only one who gets away, um, and uh, that's actually explained in the storyboards, but we'll get to that. Um, Prime then transforms and shoots uh, Ramjet, Thundercracker, Soundwave, and then lands and shoots uh, Kickback and Dirge. In the storyboards, after, after shooting Kickback and Dirge, uh, Blitzwing flies down from the sky and uh, tackles Optimus uh, for, and makes him drop his weapon. Um, he's then piled on by Starscream, Astrotrain, and Skywarp. 
uh, on his back. And uh, the scene then actually cuts away to uh, Devastator entering Autobot City, where Ultra Magnus is in vehicle mode with Red Alert, Sideswipe, and Trax uh, riding in tow. They all transform and shoot Devastator, blowing him apart. The Constructicons then, this is a great scene that I uh, really wish it was animated. Uh, the Constructicons then transform into robot mode and start firing on the Autobots. Ultra Magnus sideswipe, Red Alert tracks all flee, but Red Alert gets it in the back and falls to the floor uh, and is shown just lying on the ground as the Decepticons, uh, the Constructicons in particular, run past him and further into the base. We then pan up to Megatron watching uh, the Carnage and Prime uh, showing up behind him, which is where the film picks up after Prime shoots uh, Kickback and Dirge. So we're just going to assume that he got Starscream and Skywarp and the gang off of him. And now it's time for Prime to take down Megatron in arguably the most famous exchange of dialogue in the history of Transformers. Prime! One shall stand, one shall fall. Why throw away your life so recklessly? That's a question you should ask yourself, Megatron. And now another fun thing that's in the storyboards here. So uh, in between Prime saying uh, that's a question you should ask yourself, uh, at on the storyboard, after he says that's a question, he actually gets um, blindsided by Dirge, but he catches him before uh, he can do anything, grabs him, flips him over, and slams him down on his head uh, with, quote, shattering force. Um, so <laughs> that would have been neat to see, uh, but I think it might have broken up the tension just a little bit out. And Prime and Megatron uh, fight in one of the epic film battles of all time. And uh, in the storyboards, the battle still rages on outside with Cup, Hot Rod, Springer, RC, and Daniel fighting uh, Decepticons, uh, shooting Thundercracker and um, uh, going after Soundwave, uh, fighting Hook. There's, there's a lot of neat things. Blasters in one of these scenes as Prime and Megatron still fight. And that is where... Um, it leads up to Hot Rod uh, wanting in on the Optimus Megatron fight before Cup tells him uh, not to go. And this is a great fight sequence that continues thereafter between the two. <laughs> in one of the shots in the foreground during uh, Optimus and Megatron, as we get back to them, uh, the storyboard shows Red Alert dead on the ground uh, in the corner. <laughs> so they continue to fight. This is where... Um, the fight gets really good. <laughs> I really don't want to say much more than that. Uh, the fight sequence and the choreography here is really cool, but ultimately Prime wins and has Megatron dead to rights. And going one more time back to the storyboards, because and I don't want to do this whole movie via the storyboards if I don't have to, but there's so many neat little tidbits that were changed or left out, probably just for brevity's sake and for uh, pacing. Hot Rod is actually fighting Scrapper, and Cup is fighting Bone Crusher right before Cup tells Prime to finish off Megatron. And from here, Megatron sees a gun and attempts to delay. No more, Optimus Prime! Grant me mercy, I beg of you! You were without mercy. Now plead for it. I thought you were made of sterner stuff. And this is where the foreshadowing of Hot Rod wanting to be in on the fight comes in. Uh, he goes to stop Megatron and gets in the way of Prime getting a clear shot. Megatron grabs that gun, shoots Optimus three times, and then goes in for the finishing blow. I would have waited an eternity for this. It's over, Prime. <sighs> and so with the last of his strength, Prime had hit Megatron, knocking him off a ledge where Megatron falls several stories. Um, Prime collapses, and the Decepticons retreat to Astro Train. And Astro Train transforms into train mode. I think it's really funny that when he rolls up in train mode, um, his sound effect has the sound as if he's on train tracks. Here, give a listen. Astro Train, transform and get us out of here! <laughs>
And once again, the storyboards give a little bit of insight to the scene because as the Decepticons are boarding Astrotrain, um, they're carrying some of their fallen. And it is noted in the storyboard that both uh, Kickback and uh, Bombshell are dead when they're being carried. Uh, also noted and not sh animated in the film is that uh, in one of the wider shots, uh, there's a dead Autobot on the ground. And in parentheses, it is mentioned that it is Trailbreaker. Uh, so there was a lot more carnage in this film than was actually animated. So if you thought the film was brutal uh, in its own cut, uh, the Battle of Autobot City, per the storyboard, was much, much worse. And another neat little thing there is, of course, Soundwave rescues Megatron, and Rumble, the blue one, uh, being tiny, has to carry Megatron's fusion cannon as they retreat. So the Decepticons retreat, Astro Train takes off, and Prime has turned the tide. And now... We go off to the medical bay later on where Prime uh, is being examined by Perceptor and he is dying. And in his final moments, he decides that he's going to pass off the Matrix of Leadership. And it's interesting to note here that it's Matrix of Leadership, not the creation Matrix that was established in the comics uh, two years prior. Uh, Prime chooses Ultra Magnus and in choosing Magnus, Prime explains the Matrix, and coins two of the most important phrases in Transformers history. One day, an Autobot shall rise from our ranks and use the power of the Matrix to light our darkest hour. Until that day, till all are one. And as he hands it to him, um, he runs out of strength and drops the Matrix, which Hot Rod catches, and uh, then becomes all shiny and a bit of foreshadowing. Um, Prime then dies uh, and turns gray and kids everywhere for generations to come and yet to come are scarred for life. And for more on the effects of the death of Optimus Prime, I'm going to send it over to Michael, a.k.a. Soundjack, from the Steel City Bots podcast. The moment that probably has stuck with me the most from the movie is probably the death of Optimus Prime. I mean, 90% of that movie is incredibly memorable, and even as someone who didn't grow up when the movie actually aired in theaters... That movie overall is incredibly nostalgic to me, just as someone that is a Transformers fan, because so much of the movie has so much significance and importance to the whole of the Transformers franchise and mythos. Um, and just in terms of the references that come from it, most of it comes from the movie. But the death of Optimus Prime has got to be the one with the strongest impact <laughs> and i'm probably not going to be the only one to say this uh, but the music the mood the setting the the reactions how it was staged everything was so perfectly put together to leave the greatest impact of this character is truly gone <laughs> and I watched this movie before I understood what Generation 1 was. I thought somehow this was supposed to be a prequel to Transformer Cybertron, even. Uh, I don't know how I thought that. But even still, that is still the scene I was most uh, aware of, even if I couldn't remember the exact details of what was going on. That was the scene that I could still be like, geez, that was sad. And... Oh. Uh, it still gets me every time I see the movie. And while Michael skews towards the younger side of the current Transformers fandom, uh, I also want to toss it back over to Daryl from Transmissions, uh, who encapsulates both that this film had an effect on everyone at the time and how it's still inextricably tied to G.I. Joe. I remember going to see it in the theater with my cousin, who is six months younger than me, so uh, we're, we're basically the same age, and I can recall 
him crying. I don't remember if I cried, but I vividly remember him in tears in the parking lot as we were uh, leaving the theater. It was a very sad movie, obviously. Uh, We were... um, It came out in September, I believe. So he would have just turned six. I was six. So, um, yeah, it was traumatizing for six-year-olds. And, uh, heck, it still is. As As I grew up, you know, I started to, you know, realize that it was a business decision, what they did in the movie. Um, and it was a poor one at the time. I thought, um, the, I, it, I wasn't until it wasn't until I was probably 17 to 19 years old. I, somewhere in there that I found out there was an actual GI Joe movie. I had no idea. And that it was changed because of what happened in the Transformers movie that uh, they were going to kill Duke and and then because of what happened to Optimus Prime they didn't and thus with the passing of the Matrix Unicron is angry uh, as he realizes this is the only thing that can defeat him uh, the Decepticons are stumbling through space in Astro Train where we get this famous line jettison some weight or I'll never make it to Cybertron so the argument about this line has always been uh, jettison some weight. So in space, <laughs> unless you're on a planet, because weight is created by gravity, which requires a spinning body in space, what he must have meant was jettison some mass. Uh, of course, uh, going by this scene, Astro Train has a lot of robots inside of him, so I don't know if his size actually contributes um, to him maybe having some sort of gravitational pull. But for more on this scene, I'm going to toss it over uh, to one of our Patreon supporters, host of uh, Podvocacy and Wrestling on the Edge of Forever, Jason Kirk. Hello, everyone. Your friendly neighborhood, Jason. And when Anthony asked me to pick my favorite scene, or at least the scene from the Transformers, the movie that stuck with me the most, or the longest, I thought to myself, well, self, that's going to be difficult because there's lots of those. However, uh, there is one in particular, and I'm I'm hoping no one else has taken it so far. And that's the mo- that's the uh, scene after the attack on Autobot City, where they're in Astro Train, and Astro Train uh, informs the Decepticons that they need to lose some weight if they're going to make the Cybertron. And of course, Starscream, being his opportunistic self, takes it upon himself to lighten the load the best way he knows how. Oh, how it pains me to do this! Wait, I still function. Wanna bet? The deviousness in which Chris Latta delivers that line for Starscream just tickles me every time I hear it. Um, And of course, the scene continues a little bit after that, and we, when they start to battle for supremacy of the Decepticons, and uh, Devastator forms inside Astro Train, that also stuck with me, because how is there room in a space shuttle for Devastator? That's ridiculous. Um, But yet somehow, and granted, there's mass shifting in Transformers, but that always just made, you know, that just always stuck out to me. Like, wow, they really thought that would make sense. And of course, Rumble and Frenzy also doing their thing in Astro Train. It's it's just craziness, and it shows what happens to Decepticons when they have no leader. And I love it for that reason. So it's a great scene, and I uh, really enjoy it every time I see it and think about it. And it's funny because... Uh, this scene, at least by going by the storyboards, also uh, meant to be a bit longer, uh, the fighting a little more detailed. Nothing uh, too crazy, though. So we cut away to the Decepticons. And uh, why are they floating in space like this? Uh, the Detritus Decepticons are floating in space and end up at Unicron. Now, Unicron uh, introduces himself to Megatron and strikes a deal. He will provide Megatron with a new body and new troops. And? And nothing. You belong to me. No. I belong to nobody! So Megatron takes the deal and is turned into Galvatron. And then Unicron then goes on to use the Insecticon and Seeker guys to create Scourge and the Sweeps and Cyclonus and quote his armada 
Uh, we're never really explained to what his armada is, other than there's a second Cyclonus animated in that sequence. And so this has always been a bit of a controversy in uh, the Transformers fandom as to who is turned into who. So logistically speaking, uh, it should be Thundercracker is turned into Scourge and the Insecticons are turned into Sweeps and Skywarp um, is Cyclonus and the other Insecticon in the scene, Bombshell, is, quote, his armada. But Bombshell is in the foreground of the shot, so you're left to believe that Bombshell is turned into Cyclonus and Skywarp is turned into the uh, odd man out. Now, if you take into consideration the the script itself, uh, the words used prior to this scene and the scene after it, plus uh, what we can find from the storyboards, uh, that may not be the case at all. So the storyboard calls for a dead Decepticon um, to be turned out of uh, this scene into Scourge. Um, that could be any of them. Uh, it just happens that Thundercracker is in the front. Um, and then it does specifically call out Bombshell in the front of the scene making Cyclonus. But Unicron's words were a new body for Megatron and new troops to command. So he only promised a new body to Megatron. The other guys are technically new troops and new people. So they are, for what it's worth, dead. Uh, and born as something new, just using their old bodies. We also have to take into consideration, um, and this goes with the next scene on Cybertron, is that the Insecticons were able to create clones of themselves. This was established in the show and shown many times. The Seekers, like Thundercracker and Skywarp, also had many generic versions of themselves floating around. Uh, so that's also worth noting that these could have been generic Seekers as well, because in the next scene on Cybertron, there's a ceremony going on to coronate Starscream. And in the audience, in the first shot, in the wide shot, are the Insecticons, Thundercracker, and Skywarp. And we also find out the Constructicons can play uh, trumpets, even though not all of them have mouths. And Galvatron decides to crash the party. And for more on this scene, here is Jim Simonic of Distortion Productions. Hey, this is Jim Simonic with uh, Distortion Productions. Uh, I guess the scene that really stands out for me is the uh, the scene where Galvatron disintegrates Starscream. I guess is probably the scene that stuck with me throughout all of these years and uh, still resonates with me. Galvatron is my favorite uh, uh, Decepticon. And um, I got to say, it's it's still to this day an amazing movie. I, uh, I break it out every once in a while on Blu-ray and, uh, and still enjoy it. And you can check out Jim's CD, Respect the Prime 1986 Revisited, at his website at www.distortionprod.com. Dot com. That's uh, D-I-S-T-O-R-T-I-O-N-P-R-O-D dot com. And this scene, Jim wasn't the only one who this scene uh, resonated with. And so, for even more on uh, the impact of Galvatron killing Starscream, Radio Few Cybertron's own, Brian Kilby. I've watched this movie, I can't tell you how many times. The first summer that I actually had it on tape, I literally watched it two to three times a day, every day. I'm right now calculating. I've, I've seen this movie about 600 times, and I've never actually had a chance to see it in the theater up until recently, back in the September uh, Fathoms event showing. And watching it, the moment for me just struck me out of the blue because I wasn't thinking about it for the first time in a long time. I wasn't just waiting for it. It just happened, and I got a visceral thrill, like just shot right through me as I was watching it. It's the moment right after Galvatron destroys Starscream. Starscream lights up. He turns to ash, and the crown bounces down the stairs and lands at Galvatron's feet. And Galvatron just crushes it with his foot, and he does the little foot drag, and it's just so elegant in its destruction and for whatever reason that's always just stood out to me is just like the coolest thing and i don't know why galvatron's my favorite character but not that version of galvatron 
So I think that it's, I don't know, if, if life's a journey, Galvatron started off as this elegant, powerful character, and he wound up a madman. And it's, I guess it's just the juxtaposition of the Galvatron that I love versus this. And I, I don't know, whatever, whenever I watch it, it just it stands out to me. I was watching it with my buddy Chris, and after the movie, he was like, Starscream's crown, did it mean as much to you this time as it did the last time? And I was like, it really did. And with the crown crushed and the Decepticons wanting to know who their new leader is, Rumble, the blue one, has one question. What did he say his name was? And that soundbite is actually... Um, what prompted me to go hunt down the storyboards is I remember seeing this at a BotCon, uh, a very, uh, one of the panels at an old BotCon, they showed off some of the storyboards before they were available online. And uh, after Rumble, the blue one says, uh, what did he say his name was? It was actually scripted for Bone Crusher to go, he didn't. And then for Galvatron to say his name before the Decepticons all hail. Galvatron! <laughs> And with new leadership at the top of the Autobots and the Decepticons, we're going to put a pin in this episode for now, but not without talking a little bit about uh, the character changeover. So, like, this is it. This is where the tone and the leadership has definitely switched on Transformers, not just as a movie, but as the cartoon series and as a brand as a whole. And for more on that, here is ZoneBase.org's Robo Rob Springer. I think what's really stuck with me over the years um, is just the scale and tonal change the movie brought. You know, the cartoon show went for two years prior, and it was a it was a weekday cartoon. It was what it was. There, you know, allegedly the Autobots and Decepticons are fighting this big war, but it's played out by weekday cartoon adventures. And then the movie starts. First thing you get is a planet just getting destroyed. And then the Decepticons sneak aboard the Autobot ship and just kill the crew and sneak into the city. And there's this huge battle scene. You know, you could point out the the laughable moments of the movie or you can point out. I guess I just did point out the abundance of violence or everyone goes an Optimus Prime died. But it went from like one to eleven the minute the movie started. You know, you come in like, you know, there's an episode where. The Decepticons and Autobots went back to King Arthur days, you know, or, you know, just kind of silly things like that. You know, they just used one of a uh, hound's holograms to, to fool the Decepticons by pretending it was a factory, stuff like that. And then, well, <laughs> giant serious battles the minute the movie starts. I think that's what, one of the things that really stuck with me over time and, it kind of it kind of stayed around with Transformers after that because season three was definitely played more seriously after that movie. I guess, I guess you know the the kitty gloves are off. You just saw Prowl get blown to bits right in front of you. <laughs> you know the the tone's going to change now. And while the tone of this movie and this series is about to change for a bit. Uh, this show will not. Uh, so we are going to wrap it up here and get you ready for part two of our retrospective into Transformers, the movie. Of course, if you like the show, please swing on by to our Patreon, patreon.com slash TFU info, and uh, become one of our students. You would have gotten to hear this and a whole lot more, including our uh, special Transformers, the movie roundtable with a bunch of friends of mine uh, just discussing this uh, classic film. Uh, and you can get to that at the $3 level, but you can sign up for as little as $1. And, of course, swing on by our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash TFU info, where you can check out all of our coverage uh, from New York Toy Fair and uh, just about everything we do, plus every episode of this show. And, of course, don't forget to subscribe to the show wherever you listen, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, uh, and uh, Stitcher, and... Tune in radio and wherever else you enjoy podcasts. And I am done plugging now, but don't forget to check out the website, www.tfu.info. Don't forget, next time on the show, we will wrap up this film in the next part of our uh, three-part look back on 
Transformers, the movie. So until next time, see ya.